I think it's a great movie. It's got yeah. a great look to it. Good characters, good acting, original plot. There's a lot of movies that came after this that probably owe a lot to this. Hello and welcome to another edition of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies. But before we get started, what are we drinking? Uh, we're drinking Carfax Abbey Belgian Ale. It's got a punch to it. <laughs> That's right. Gives buzz. <laughs> Ooh, good. Today we have a special request from Christine Irene Faduke for us to cover 1989's I Madman. It was funny because I just watched this last Halloween on Tubi. And then when she asked us to do it, I'm like, yeah, just go to Tubi and watch it. And it's gone from <laughs> Tubi. And the movie's like impossible to find now. I looked at the Blu-ray to buy on Amazon. It's like super expensive because it's out of print, so... This one might be hard to find, at least in Canada it was. I, Madman was directed by Tibor Takis. Ah, uh, Tibor. Good old Tibor. How many times have you saved my butt? <laughs> he did uh, The Gate and The Gate 2, just to mention two movies. Oh, The Gate 2. Oh, uh, that one's tough. But The Gate. Yep. Which we covered a that's, couple years ago. That's right, check it out. Clayton Rohner is in this. He's in one of our favorite movies, which we covered as well, April Fool's Day. He's in Nightwish, The Relic, and he's in Star Trek Next Generation. He plays Admiral Jameson, where he's all old at first, and then he, he gets all young, yeah. and he's all dancing around. <laughs> yeah. and, and Michael Patak, he's also yeah, in that episode, right. <laughs> who plays Hoffman in Halloween 4. Yeah. Loomis! Loomis! Talk about nerding out here, fucking between the horror movies and the Star Trek. <laughs> Holy fuck. Jenny Wright is also in this, and she's in a lot of movies too, in some 80s staple movies. She's in St. Elmo's Fire. Near Dark, a yeah. fantastic vampire movie starring Bill Paxton, which we covered. Yeah, check it out. And actually, the first time we covered it, it got all flagged and taken down because I put a picture from Terminator 2 in it. <laughs> yes. She's in Lawnmower Man, and she's also in the masterpiece that is Young Guns 2. <laughs> Murray Rubin has a little bit part in this, and us 80s kids will remember him from being in Ghostbusters hey, yeah. as the man at the elevator. <laughs> what are you supposed to be? Some kind of cosmonaut? Someone saw a cockroach up on 12. Some pretty big cockroach. Going up. I'll take the next one. So I Madman starts off, we hear this ragtime music playing, you go into a hotel, and there's this... Nosferatu guy all leaving, this Dr. Kessler. You're leaving Dr. Kessler? And he just grumbles and he takes off. Well, we're getting lots of complaints in Dr. Kessler's apartment there. It sounds like an animal is loose, making a lot of noise. The manager gets all pissed off. He's like, well, we can't have that. So he goes up to investigate and he opens up the apartment and like, it's some weird laboratory with all these fetuses and jars and like all this shit bubbling yeah. and everything. Need lots of bubbling in a good laboratory. <laughs> and there's also what looks like human shit on some tray in a yeah. corner. <laughs> it's all his shit. <laughs> all shits on some pan. <laughs> And he gets attacked right away by this monster, this sort of claymation style monster. Just rips him to shreds. There's a woman in the apartment next to his, and she starts hearing scratching noises, and she gets closer to the wall, and this monster busts through and kills her. And right away, we get introduced to Virginia, who's reading it all in a book. And she's just gotten so engrossed that that's what she was visualizing. And it turns out that she's reading Much of Madness, More of Sin by an author named Malcolm Brand. She gets kind of scared a little bit and she calls her boyfriend over for a beer, no less. My kind of woman. <laughs> My kind of woman. Yeah. They start getting a little bit hot and heavy on the couch and it kind of pans down and we see this guy playing a nice tune on the piano, right? So we also learn that Virginia is an aspiring actress and she also works at a bookstore. And she's trying to find this other book by that same author called I, Madman that has come in in this estate sale. But she can't find it anywhere. She comes home and the, there's a book sitting there and lo and behold, it's I, Madman. And she boils some water on the stove for tea and gets all cozy and starts reading this book. 
Immediately she gets sucked in, and time kind of passes without her realizing it. The kettle on the stove starts whistling, and she looks over at the door, and she sees the door close, as if somebody had been in the apartment with her. She goes up to lock the door, and her boyfriend comes in and starts giving her shit that she didn't lock the door. You always get weirded out reading this kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> and she starts explaining to him a little bit about the book, how it's this uh, Dr. Kessler who is in love with a woman and she thinks he's too ugly. <laughs> and so he pumps his face full of Novocaine and starts cutting pieces off. And then he starts stalking people and killing them for their features to kind of rebuild his face and make himself look prettier. <laughs> I'm prettier than this man! <laughs> <laughs> Out of nowhere, Braveheart <laughs> reference. Virginia keeps reading the book, and Kessler stalks this woman right from like a diner to her apartment. It's a really cool scene. Yeah. It's all foggy and everything, and yeah. breaks into her apartment. She's like fighting him off at the door, and he just pricks her with this needle, and it kind of puts her out, scalps her in the bathroom, and like takes her hair. Oh, I like how they show from they show his back, yeah, and you just behind, see him yeah. moving, like yeah. oh. The next day, Virginia's like walking to work and she sees in the newspaper that her friend has been murdered and her scalp was stolen. <laughs> yeah. So she's about to hop the bus and she looks behind her and that Kessler guy is there. And he's got the, the hair and everything. Yeah. It's like, like the color. <laughs> and then the bus driver, you gonna get on, ma'am? And then she kind of looks and well, no one's there. Yeah. So she's seeing things. The more Virginia reads this book, the more she, vision she starts having and like thinking that she's being stalked by this character in the book. And one night, she looks across the street at the piano repair shop where that guy's always playing piano. And you see the silhouette kills the guy and like cuts off his ears yeah. and everything. <laughs> it's, it's a cool scene. So Virginia's boyfriend, who's also a police officer, gets called to the scene of the crime, looks up and sees Virginia watching them from back down in the window. Yeah. So he's like, hmm. Because they got a, a call saying someone's being murdered. And yeah. I wonder if it was my girlfriend. And Virginia notices on the book that this book is categorized as nonfiction. And she's really curious about the author and everything because all this weird stuff is happening to her. So she goes to the publisher, visits this guy, of course, typical, got yeah. the tie all undone and the books everywhere and smoking a cigar. And yeah, whiskey, yeah. too. <laughs> like he has a, whatever's in his cup and he just spills it on the floor yeah. and fills his cup up with whiskey. I don't know what kind of, uh, how hard of a job publishing really is, but this, <laughs> these guys always look super overwhelmed and... Yeah, all greasy. Yeah, all super <laughs> greasy all the time. Anyways, he proceeds to tell her that it was categorized as nonfiction because the author, Malcolm Brand, said it was, in a way, a confession. And this is a true story. Fell in love with a woman, she didn't like him, and then carved off his features. <laughs> yeah. So Virginia keeps being stalked by, well, now we know, is Malcolm Brand. Yeah. The author of this book. And now he's got like more features every time you see him. He starts killing off more of her friends. By reading the book, she figures she knows where the next murder is going to happen by some clues left in the book. So she convinces her boyfriend to create a stakeout at the library where she thinks a murder is going to happen. Yeah. And that's where we're going to end the plot. So if you want to see what happens in I'm Madman, watch the movie if you can find the fucker. <laughs> So one of the best things about this movie is the story itself. It's pretty neat, and yeah. for the time, it feels pretty original, even though it's probably not, yeah. right? I'm sure a story like this has been done in some way, shape, or form before this. It's neat how Virginia gets sucked into the book, too, right? And then she starts seeing visions in her reality of things from the book, and she's not quite sure if it's really happening or not, right? Yeah. Um, and you as the viewer, too, you're not quite sure either. Yeah. Because at first you know that she's reading a book because she sees herself as the main character, right? She's wearing a different costume or whatever, and it's a different time period. But then as the movie moves forward, the lines begin to blur between that, mm -hmm. right? And I like how that's relatable, too, because, I mean, we've all read a book where it's so engrossing, right? Yeah. Where, you know, you, you've gotten, like, 
50 or 100 pages in and you look up at the clock and, oh shit, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I had no idea, yeah. right? The whole atmosphere and look and style of this movie is fantastic. The style of the movie is very original. It's an original looking movie. Yeah. Kind of hard to put your finger on the look, but it's kind of got like a neo-noir, neo-pulp look to it. Where it's yeah. very 40s, 50s look to it. Yeah. Even yeah. though it takes place in the 80s, it's a contemporary movie. All the imagery and fashion and stuff like that from the flashbacks still kind of bleeds through... To the 80s. Into the yeah. 80s, right? So you kind of feel this kind of flow between everything, you know, between mm -hmm. the past and the present. It's all it's all there in the present. Everything in the 80s, on the 80s side of it, is very drab too, right? Yeah. So everything's bled into each other. It, it feels like a... It felt to me like a a drab comic book kind of feel. Yeah, very know? comic booky feel. Very pulpy uh, comic yeah. pulp. And even, it's funny, like you mentioned, that the 80s, the... 80s parts, the contemporary parts are kind of drab, mm -hmm. but then the flashbacks are a bit more vivid. That's where it's kind of colorful and like, oh, the 50s and the neon signs and the the bright dresses and everything. Yeah, yeah. Meant to confuse you, I think, yeah. more so. So it goes back to like the 50s or the 40s, but it's still in her apartment. Yeah. But just all the furniture is different mm -hmm. and her clothes are different, but still her apartment, the layout's the same. The fridge is older, mm -hmm. but the stove is still the same in the 80s because it's still the same stove has been there for so long. Yeah, I yeah. kind of like that, how it kind of, like we said, it kind of bleeds between, all the lines begin to blur that mm -hmm. way. You know? Yeah. The settings for this movie are pretty cool, and there's not that many of them, really, which helps the movie because if it would jump around too much, you'd get even more confused, right? Yeah. So we've got Virginia's apartment, which is kind of neat. We just mentioned that it has this vintage look to it but there's also the bookstore so many books yeah it's like it, they're, they're going up the stairs to the next floor and the stairs are just have books piled right up to the ceiling like everywhere yeah. it's like that's a bookstore yeah you can't find anything yeah, there's no organization <laughs> it's just shit everywhere it's like yeah. yeah that's the kind of bookstore i want to go to <laughs> that's right we have a bookstore like that in winnipeg called red river books it's just a fucking exactly <laughs> like that yeah you can't find shit Ugh. can't see shit the camera work in this movie is great there's a lot of kind of like unconventional shots and just the way the camera moves throughout the scene and the mm -hmm. settings is great. It's very fluid. Yeah. Like when they move through her apartment and then it goes through the window onto the guy playing piano across the street in a different building. Neat stuff like that, you know? It's just a yeah. very fluid moving movie. There's a flow to it and it kind of mimics his movements and he's got like that cape and everything. Yeah. He's like a phantom. Yeah. So he's kind of you know, lithe, very, yeah. you know, slithery. Yeah. It's kind of neat. <laughs> it's so greasy. <laughs> the humor, too, in this movie is very, very subtle. There's not that much to really go on. But there are a few scenes, like the bookstore, right, where the, uh, the friend is talking about... I'll never meet a smart, good-looking man working at a bookstore. Yeah, there's uh, that loser guy that walks in. Hi! <laughs> He's like, see? <laughs> Yeah. That old man's all buying that book about sex positions. <laughs> she spills her coffee on that book. She's like, ah, oh, just a priceless Hemingway and throws it in the garbage. <laughs> the first edition yeah. or something. And you have to mention the madman in I Madman. Malcolm Brand is fantastic in this. Like, just the look of the guy. Yeah. Again, he's like kind of a hybrid Nosferatu, Phantom of the Opera type character. Yeah. But it's more his motive, his M.O. is very neat and original, how he finds himself ugly and carves his features off and steals features. So as the movie progresses, his look changes as he's adding to his face, yeah. you know, which is neat. <laughs> he starts off bald, and then he's got the hair, and then he's, at first he's got no nose, it's completely missing. Then mm -hmm. he's got grafted all his nose on, and... <laughs> looks even worse, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he looks worse than before, not better. <laughs> and he's played by Randall William Cook, who is connected to two movies that we already mentioned in this. He did special effects on The Gate and Ghostbusters. Yeah, pretty cool. And he was assistant director in the 2005 King Kong movie. So, 
He's got some chops. Yeah. That's for sure. Jenny Wright in this, I find, plays a pretty good, like, one-woman show in this arc that her character has, where in the beginning of the movie, she's kind of innocent. She's an innocent, you know, bookworm, yeah. right? Not that innocent, though. She invites the detective over and <laughs> fucks him right away. <laughs> yeah, there's that, yeah. yeah. But then after, as she starts getting more engrossed into the book, and she starts learning about how high the stakes are for her mirror image in the book. Yeah. Her character starts to take a bit of a nosedive. Like, you don't see her smoking in the beginning of the movie, but later she's all stressed and yeah. smoking. Yeah. She looks like shit. Yeah. Right? I really like, yeah, I like that. I like how her character has that development. That, that, that downward spiral. Yeah. And the effects in this movie are really good. Like, we already mentioned the look of the killer. Yeah. Fantastic. But, like, it's not just the look of him, but, like, before he starts putting his face together and he's, like, missing his nose. Like, the makeup's really good. And we got to mention the stop-motion animation for the monster in this. Yeah. It's really good. And not surprisingly, it looks a lot like the monster at the end of the gate. That's it's right. It like, almost looks exactly like it. It could <laughs> even be the same fucking sculpture <laughs> yeah. that they used. I kind of thought it was, you yeah. know. I was like, what? Stop motion is a great form of special effect. Yeah. That I wish, I know it's time consuming, it's expensive, but come on, bring it back. Somebody, yeah. please. Fuck the CGI. This movie does kind of suffer from a bit of pacing issue, though. You don't really feel the sense of urgency in certain scenes that you really should feel, right? A lot more of an urgency in them to do something, and it just feels kind of flat. It falls flat, right? And to jump off that with the, the pacing end of things, the ending is really kind of rushed. The showdown in the bookstore at the end is really good. Yeah. It was rushed getting there. You don't get as much as a, of a payoff as yeah. you had wished. Basically, the ending is rushed. Yeah. It is a confusing ending, too. It's like, wh what? Yeah, you're kind of left with more <laughs> questions than answers. Yeah. Which is sort of sad in this kind of movie, because... We're not big fans of a lot of explanation, but this movie kind of needs it. We're not going to spoil it, yeah. but it just sort of needed a little more at the end. Especially when the main character takes so much time doing investigating and trying to solve this mystery and get to the bottom of what's happening here. And then he doesn't really find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then also as the viewer, you're left going, huh? Yeah. Like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna wreck the ending for you guys. Watch the movie to find out what it is, but it does involve a bunch of fucking pages, <laughs> book pages, and just going, hmm. Yeah, I wonder what that means. Yeah. But that being said, it does not hurt the movie in any way, really. I mean, it, you know, you're you're still satisfied throughout. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. we're just nitpicking a little things. You yeah, know. yeah. But it doesn't hurt the movie, and it doesn't hurt the the way you perceive it, and. Uh, I think it's definitely one to check out. Oh, it's great. I think it's a great movie. It's got yeah. a great look to it. Good characters, good acting, original plot. Yeah, you can definitely see there's a lot of movies that came after this that probably owe a lot to this. Like, um... In the Mouth of Madness? Oh, you know, it's just, I was just going to say it. Yeah, yeah, In the Mouth of Ma Madness, um, Dark Man. Yeah, for this, sure. this definitely has a Dark Man vibe to it. That yeah. kind of cartoony... Yeah feel to it, you know? Even his look, he's all yeah. missing half his face yeah. and shit. Like... Yeah, yeah. If you can find it, definitely check it out. It's the second time I've watched it. I'm probably gonna watch it at least another time yeah, before a... I die. <laughs> that says a lot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and until then, keep drinking. I'll, I'll be on my deathbed <laughs> about to watch it for the last time I yeah. die <sighs> before I start it. <laughs> Didn't get that third time. Mm.